Enzyme purification and specific activity. How can you apply your knowledge of biochemistry to real world problems? Well, how about generating an environmentally friendly alternative energy? What you know about enzyme purification can actually help refine biofuel production. Imagine you are in charge of producing biofuel at an industrial scale. In hopes of finding an effective way to degrade plant biomass, you look to natural decomposers, fungi. Fungi contain an enzyme called beta-glucosidase, which is able to take partially degraded cellulose, called cellobios, and hydrolyze it to make free glucose, which can be used for energy. Your job is to produce exactly the amount of active beta-glucosidase that you need for your reaction, because too little will mean you can't produce energy from all the cellobios you're using, which is a waste of cellobios and bad for the environment and too much will mean wasted beta-glucosidase and wasted money, which is bad for business. But how do you tell how much purified active enzyme you need and how much you have? If your enzyme isn't purified enough, you might have less active enzyme than you think. And how do you fix your purification method if it's not working well enough? Where would you even start? The best way to quantify enzyme purity is to determine its specific activity. Specific activity is calculated by dividing a measure of enzyme activity by the total protein amount in your sample mixture. So how do you get those two numbers? You can measure enzyme activity through various assays that all work basically the same way. You start with a sample of purified enzyme, so in this case, beta-glucosidase. Then you perform a reaction under specific known conditions where you give your enzyme the reactants it needs and measure the amount of product, or glucose, it produces over time. Generally, scientists have defined an enzyme unit as the amount of enzyme needed to produce one micromole of product in one minute under specific conditions. Thus, for simplicity, we often write enzymatic activity in terms of units, rather than micromoles of product per minute. Okay. So you now know what the activity of purified beta-glucosidase is, but how does that help you figure out how pure your sample of beta-glucosidase is? In other words, how do you get from beta-glucosidase activity to beta-glucosidase specific activity, which is a measure of purity? Specific activity is beta-glucosidase activity, which, hang on, what units is that measured in? Right, micromoles of glucose per minute, or enzyme units, divided by the total protein amount of your sample mixture in milligrams. This gives you a measure of how much beta-glucosidase activity there is in any given amount of your sample. Okay, so you still need the total protein amount in your sample mixture. How do you measure that? You can use a colorimetric technique, like the Bradford assay and spectrophotometry, to measure the concentration of total protein in your sample mixture. Do you remember how the Bradford assay works? Protein reacts with Bradford reagent to produce a colored substance, and you can use a spectrophotometer to measure the concentration of that colored substance. From the concentration in your sample's volume, you can calculate the protein amount of your sample in milligrams. But why bother calculating specific activity if you already have the protein concentration of your sample? Remember, you're trying to purify beta-glucosidase from fungi, so there are more proteins in your sample mass than just beta-glucosidase. Specific activity tells you how much beta-glucosidase activity there is in your mixture of other proteins. You will need this information to use your purified protein mixture to break down cellobios and make energy. Specific activity also helps you monitor the success of your purification process. It's possible that some condition of your purification procedure, like buffer pH, might actually reduce beta-glucosidase activity through degradation, or you may unknowingly co-purify an inhibitor of beta-glucosidase. So, how do you use specific activity to help you purify beta-glucosidase? You're starting with crude fungal cell lysate. First, you do a salt fractionation which uses varying concentrations of ammonium sulfate to precipitate beta-glucosidase plus other proteins. 
After this round of purification, you end up with a lot of the beta-glucosidase activity that you started with in your crude lysate, but also a large amount of protein other than beta-glucosidase. So your total protein concentration is high. And taken together, that means your specific activity is pretty low. What happens next if you perform ion exchange chromatography to separate proteins based on charge? In this example, you use anion exchange, where positively charged proteins flow off the column and negatively charged proteins, like beta-glucosidase, bind to the positively charged column. After you've washed off the positively charged proteins, you use an increased concentration of salt to release beta-glucosidase and other negatively charged proteins from the column and collect them. Because science is messy and not perfect, you recover less beta-glucosidase activity than you started with, due to some enzyme loss. However, you reduce the total protein amount in your sample mixture by a lot because you eliminate many proteins with a different charge than beta-glucosidase. So, your specific activity is greater than after the first salt fractionation step. This is great because during a purification, your goal is for your specific activity to increase after each step. Finally, you use size exclusion chromatography to filter proteins in your mixture based on size. Proteins larger than the fractionation range of the column do not enter the porous beads and flow off the column first while smaller proteins travel through the porous beads, which will take a bit of time, and so they come off later. You still lose some beta-glucosidase activity, but you reduce the total amount of protein recovered even more than the previous two steps, so your specific activity increases yet again. So, at the end of the purification process, enzyme activity relative to the total amount of protein is much greater than at the beginning because at each step, you got rid of protein from your mixture. But you designed your purification to selectively get rid of other proteins more than beta-glucosidase. And there you have it. You have successfully purified your beta-glucosidase sample. After calculating specific activity, you now know how much beta-glucosidase activity there is in your sample. So, you can tell if you have enough active purified beta-glucosidase to hydrolyze the amount of cellobios in your reaction. So now you're ready to take on your next challenge. Whether it's producing biofuels using purified fungal enzymes or acing your next biochemistry course, you'll know what to do with specific activity and enzyme purification. So I'm going to talk a little bit about electrophoresis, and I want to make sure that I am able to both keep those of you that haven't done it involved, but also those of you that have done it and think you know all about it, let me, let me make sure that we fill in some gaps. So let's talk now about how we're going to look at this, which is, of course, by electrophoresis. And electrophoresis in general, right, is based on, a, basically, it's a separation based on charge. Separation based on, I didn't want to say separation based on the, let's say, the number of charged amino acids. Right, and so it's going to be some function of our lysines, histidines, arginines, aspartates, glutamates, right? And every protein is going to have some net charge, right? Plus, 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 minus, 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 depending on the number of positive or negative charges. And so if I now apply an electric field, where I put the plus end of it here and the minus end of it here, right, there's going to be some force on that particle and it's going to move. And the force, as you well know, is just equal to the charge on the, on the, on the molecule. I guess I shouldn't put Q. I'll put Z, where Z is the charge of our protein, okay? And, which, of course, is simply equal to MA, where A is the acceleration. So now what's going to happen? That particle is going to move faster and faster and faster in that electric field, okay, except it's going to be opposed by a frictional force. Okay? So the frictional force that's going to oppose the movement, we'll call it F friction, is simply equal to F times V. V is, of course, the velocity here. And F is this frictional coefficient. Now. 
at equilibrium, once I reach equilibrium, that means, of course, now, that will occur when the net charge on the protein times the electric field is simply balanced by the frictional force that limits how fast we go, and our protein will now move with some constant velocity, V, in that electric field. Okay? So we can say that the speed with which this molecule moves is simply equal to Z times the electric field strength divided by F, this frictional coefficient. Now I can do this in solution. I can do it in a gel, something we'll talk about in a minute, that acts as a sieve, right? Um, and if I do this, this is called, if I do it in a gel, this is going to be called native gel electrophoresis. Here's my gel. I can put my proteins up in the top of this gel. It's a 3D structure. I'm only drawing it in 2D because I'm a terrible artist. Okay. And if I apply an electric field, a minus charge here, and a, whoops, sorry, a plus charge here, and a minus charge up there, what's going to happen? Well, some of the proteins, if they happen to be negatively charged, are going to move in this direction. But some of the proteins, if they're positively charged, aren't going to move into the gel. They're going to try to move in this direction. Right? So our negatively charged proteins move here. Our positively charged proteins try to move backwards. That's going to be a problem. And furthermore, the amount that my proteins move into this native gel is determined entirely not just by their charge, but by F, this frictional coefficient. And F depends on the shape if my protein is perfectly spherical, if it's a big long rod, they're going to move differently in this gel. Okay? So native, this is called, as I said, this is called a native gel. And it's called native because the protein isn't unfolded. Right? And clearly, if I do a native gel, I'm going to end up with two problems. Right? Proteins moving in opposite directions. Right? And proteins whose movement depends on the shape of the protein. Doesn't mean it's a bad technique. People do this technique. It's sometimes useful. But it's not going to be helpful for what we want to talk about, which is purifying proteins from scratch. We want to use electrophoresis to be able to see all the proteins. Remember I showed you that, that handout that had all the proteins. So we want to see all the proteins in our purification. So what we need, let me try to make better use of board space here. So what we need to visualize all the proteins in our purification is two things. We need, one, all the proteins to move in the same direction. And the second thing we want is we want separation based on length. based on protein molecular weight, okay? MW, molecular weight. Heavier proteins we want to migrate less, lighter proteins we want to migrate more. And the only way that we can do this now is we have to have a way so that to make a 100 amino acid protein migrate slower than a 200, to make a 200 amino acid protein migrate slower than a 100 amino acid protein. And so the way we're going to do this is we're going to do gel electrophoresis of unfolded proteins. All of which are uniformly negatively charged. All uniformly negatively charged. And to do that, we're going to use a technique known as SDS page. We'll talk about both parts of this in a minute. SDS page. Let's talk about this SDS. SDS stands for sodium dodecyl sulfate. A molecule that looks like this. Okay. 
molecular weight, sorry, formula is CH3, CH2, 11. O, S, O, 3, minus Na plus. Okay. Sodium dodecyl sulfate. That's this SDS page term. Okay. And what does this do? Well, if we take our protein, we'll make today's protein purple. We take our protein that looks like this, and we add SDS to it. Our protein now becomes completely extended, and those SDS molecules stick to the outside. where I'm using this circle at the end of this to indicate that sulfate head group. Okay? So this circle is this. Okay? And you see what it does is it uniformly coats all of these proteins. And it does so so that there's about one SDS molecule for every two amino acids. And what this means is that now I have a uniform charge to mass ratio. Uniform charge to mass ratio. Okay? Now, is there a problem? Are all my proteins going to unfold if I add SDS to this? What might stop them from completely unfolding? Somebody, give me a guess. Co what kind of covalent bonds? Disulfide bonds, right? Remember, we talked about disulfide bonds. If my protein has a disulfide bond in it, right, it's not going to unwind. Suppose I have a protein that looks like this. And it happens to have a disulfide bond here, and it has another disulfide bond here. Right? Those disulfide bonds are not going to break. And so I need a way to break those disulfide bonds. I need to add a reducing agent. There are two reducing agents that are in common use, and we'll go through both of them quickly. One of them is called beta mercaptoethanol. And beta mercaptoethanol, just like the name sounds, is basically ethanol, where on the beta carbon you have a thiol group, an SH group. And if I take this molecule that you see here, and I heat this in the presence of SDS and beta mercaptoethanol, two, two molecules of beta mercapto, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to add four molecules of beta mercaptoethanol, what I will end up with then at the end will be this, SH, SH, SH. SH, all of those cysteine residues, remember cysteine was the two cysteines that were disulfide bonded to each other, are reduced. What happened to the beta mercaptoethanol in the process? Well, the beta mercaptoethanol became oxidized. So now I have this, CH2, CH2, S, and a second beta mercaptoethanol molecule linked to this, OH. So this protein became reduced, and this became oxidized. Now, in addition to, to, to beta mercaptoethanol, there's another common reagent that I can use, and that common reagent is known as, as DTT, dithiothreatol, dithiothreatol equals DTT, sometimes called Cleland's reagent, after the biochemist who discovered this, or who invented it, actually. Okay, Cleland's reagent. And again, the idea is the same. Let's take a molecule that looks like this. It's got a disulfide bond in it, and we will add to it Cleland's reagent. Cleland's reagent looks like this. Okay. 
it's basically a four carbon sugar, three atoll, that has two SH groups on it. Okay. And now, of course, if I heat this up, heat, and I do this in the presence of SDS, what I will end up with then in the end will be my blue protein molecule that now has two reduced SH groups and Cleland's reagent now, which will look like this. What happened to my protein? Reduced or oxidized? Who says it's oxidized? Who says it's reduced? Yeah, and, and Cleland's reagent became oxidized. oxidized. Now you can see the beauty of this, right? It's an intramolecular reaction. That's why Cleland thought this up, because it's going to go a lot faster than beta mercaptoethanol, because look, you got these two SH groups right next to each other in a cyclic structure. Pretty good. Well, not cyclic yet, but it will be cyclic. If I have a uniform charge to mass ratio, and I run these, and I try to do electrophoresis in solution, is that going to work? Am I going to be able to separate my proteins in solution? If they're all the same shape, and they have a uniform charge to mass ratio, they're all drawn out lines like that? Not very well, right? Because as long as they have the same, the same charge to mass ratio, they're going to move at about the same rate of speed. So clearly, I need something better than just liquid to do this in. I have to have a sieve, some way that the longer molecules are going to take longer to get through than the smaller molecules, even though they have the same, even though they have the same charge to mass ratio. I need a molecular sieve. Who doesn't know what a sieve is? Raise your hands. All right, a sieve is like a strainer, right? So I need some sort of a molecular strainer that's going to let the, th the small molecules th through faster than it lets the large molecules through. And the way I'm going to make this molecular sieve is a gel. And I'm going to make my gel out of polyacrylamide, OK? So we're going to call this a polyacrylamide gel. How do I make this polyacrylamide gel? So we're going to make a polyacrylamide gel. And to do that, I have to remind you what acrylamide is. Acrylamide is this. OK? It's, in, it's a double, it's two carbons double bonded with an amide stuck on one end of these, OK? This is acrylamide. And if I do this in the presence of persulfate, which is S2O8, whoops, S2O8, it's an oxygen, 2 minus, this disproportionates into SO4 minus dot, OK? And I do this in the presence of an accelerator, something called TMED, that's an accelerator. What happens is I end up with a molecule that looks like this, CH2. That sulfate radical that you see here from persulfate that disproportionated into SO4 minus dot, okay? That radical steals one of the electrons from this double bond. So now I have an unsatisfied bond here with a radical. What do you think this is going to do? It's going to steal an electron from a neighboring acrylamide bond. And then I'm going to end up, when it does this, with this, CH2, CH. CONH2, CH2, CH, CONH2, and I have another unsatisfied bond. Okay. What is that unsatisfied bond going to do? Same thing. It's going to steal another electron from another acrylamide molecule, and this is going to keep going on and on and on. 
Raise your hand if you're class 10, or well, I'm sorry, if you're course 10 or course 3. What do we call this reaction? We do it with nylon all the time. What's it called? Radical polymerization, right? Now, what's going to happen at the end of this, right? Am I going to make a gel? No. I'm going to make a long polymer like nylon. I'm not going to make a gel. If I want to make a gel, I have to have some way for these long radical chains that I'm going to grow, that are going to grow like this, to be cross-linked to each other. So I need a cross-linker. And that cross-linker that I'm going to add is called bisacrylamide, which stands for methylene bisacrylamide. And what that looks like is this. So you can see that what I have here is one acrylamide molecule shown here and another acrylamide molecule shown here that are linked together by this methylene bridge. Why is this going to work as a cross-linker? Because once I get radical polymerization started, I'm going to build a chain here, right? And another radical reaction might form a chain over here. And now these two chains are linked together by this bisacrylamide. So the end result of this is going to be I'm going to have one chain like this and another chain like that and a cross link in there. And that if I continue doing this, dot, 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 I will eventually end up with a whole long series of molecules all linked together in some type of chain structure. And this gives me my gel. Now. What we typically do, as I suspect many of you are aware, is we take this, is we do this, we pour this gel between two glass plates. So I have a thin slab of gel, and now I'm going to apply a negative charge here and a positive charge here. Why do I put the positive charge at the bottom? What charge are all of my proteins from the SDS? Negative. So they're all going to try to move their way through that gel. And you can see that as they try to go through this sieve, this strainer, this gel, the small molecules are going to be able to run pretty quickly, whereas the larger molecules are going to have a hard time and they're going to take longer to go through. So as I run this gel as a function of time, the smaller molecules move fast and the intermediate ones move in intermediately and the, the bigger ones move slower. So I can separate all these molecules now based entirely on their size or their molecular weight. Okay? What do I do after I run this gel? How do I see the proteins in the gel? I mean the proteins are right, you can't see most proteins at least, you can't really see. So how, do I, how am I going to see them? Think back, what did we talk about earlier? How did I measure protein concentration? Dye, right? I'm going to add a dye. So I'm going to stain the gel with a dye. What dye do you think I should use? Kumasi blue. Okay. So I have two choices here. I can use Kumasi blue, which isn't a bad way to go. Kumasi blue, if you use it, will let you detect up to I should write detect up to about 0.1 micrograms of protein. So that's about the minimum I can have in a band to typically see it. Another way I can do this is I can use something called a silver stain. Turns out the proteins will react with, with silver. So I can do a series of reactions to make the protein reactive and add silver. And now when I look at my gel, the gel will have color based on where the silver reacted with the protein. 
And this lets you detect as little as 0 0.02 micrograms, right? Which is about 20, or is exactly 20 nanograms of protein. So silver staining is what you want to use when you don't have a lot of protein.